the director of the museum, which is the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and um, I encourage each and every one of you to come and um, visit us uh, if you're ever in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm, I'm there pretty much every day. And uh, right now we're uh, a panel of Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, uh, me and Ed. Um, Ed, you can introduce yourself. Uh, to Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Ed Piscor. I'm a cartoonist from Pittsburgh. Uh, I work on a comic called Hip Hop Family Tree, which is a very linear uh, history of, um, of rap music beginning in New York City in about 1975. And uh, four volumes have come out so far. Um, the latest one covering the time period between um, late 1984 and early 1985. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well. I'll, I'll just jump to a couple of questions that I had for, your, for you specifically. Um, th this, so this panel is supposed to be on, 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 on music and comics, and um, at certain points we went back and forth about what to call it, and we ended up just saying music and comics, but um, for a while there we were thinking um, hip hop versus punk, and, and um, it doesn't make any sense because there's such a crossover in, in both Love and Rockets and in Ed's work um, of both of those genres in pop culture in, in, in general, so we... We don't need to vamp anymore. No. <laughs> What's up, Jaime? I thought it was four o'clock, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so so we're, just, uh, we're just starting off here. So um, um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Ed, and then I was gonna leave this toward the end, but I'll ask it now since we've already started on it, but um, your, your, your comic, The Hip Hop Family Tree, is such a synthesis of um, forms and everything. And I just wonder, like, in a way, it's, it, it's, it's, it's so perfectly aligned to what hip hop is because um, you're sampling um, through the way that you produce it from everything from uh, the size of the comics to the coloring that you're doing and, and specifically the way that you, your process for coloring, the way that you're sampling um, direct images from old comics and, and in putting it all together into like a new mixture of your, your own thing. And I just, I just wonder like um, how conscious of you, were you of, of this whole process specifically for that form? I'm extremely conscious of it because uh, I saw uh, in a very clear tandem between hip hop and comics um, in terms of like sampling. You know, the comic book version is you know, we call it swiping, um, but it's essentially the same thing where you're taking, you know, some, some, some existing element and uh, using, it, using it for your own purposes. So, you know, I just use the hip hop vernacular when I talk about the way I created my color palette or something, which is um, something I achieved just by scanning in the colors from, you know, one of my 30,000 comics in, in, my, uh, in my studio. Um, you know, like if I need a blue, I would just look for a big, uh, you know, treasury size edition Superman comic that had a perfect cyan swatch that would be super big that I could scan in and multiply so that I could, so that I could have all of, uh, all of the grit and the decay from, you know, a 40 year old comic and, and, and bring that into, uh, into my work. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's completely conscious. Even Jack Kirby swiped sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, but I've I've seen your like you show me on your your, your computer your 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 color library and and, and um, it's it's insane, the amount of um, colors that you have there that are all lifted from old comics and everything. So yeah. like, um, what what do you have an exact number on that? Is it always changing? It's, Is it it's sixty four. It's sixty four colors that were the primary colors that were available for about the first one hundred years of four color. Uh, print technology. Um, so I found this color chart that had the exact mixtures of, you know, just like at home you have your printer that has like a, you know, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black cartridge to make, you know, any number of colors when you print out like a beautiful photo. Same sort of thing with comics. The only difference is uh, within the first hundred years of comics production, the process was super cheap. 
Um, so, you know, you would see the, the dots that would make up, uh, you know, the flesh tone or something like that. So once I found those, um, those mixtures, I was able to kind of reverse engineer it, um, find my own swatches of cyan, magenta, and yellow, and then make my own mixtures. So I spent about a week, like, like a mad scientist, just in my room not sleeping, making the exact palette so that I could have, you know, something extremely faithful to um, the time period that I was covering. And that said, like when I get further into the 80s, I'm not going to like make my stuff look like Kamiko comics or, or, <laughs> or something like that because they started to increase, they started to use black in their color mixtures and it just looks like diarrhea. <laughs> and I figured out how to do it, but then I realized, ooh, I, I fucking hate this. Yeah. <laughs> so like I'm not going to do it just because it's authentic. Like I'm not going to do something I hate just because it's authentic to the time period. Like there was a real bleeding edge in comics production like when we, there was like Baxter paper and stuff like that. Like right, 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 right. really look crappy. No, no, no but the, the thing, one thing that's similar for both of you guys in, in you know, it's, it's slightly different because your, your ages are, um, you know, not the same. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, you both grew up and um, have retained your love for old comics, and, and it comes through in, in, in all of your, your work. And um, I mean, one thing I wanted to ask is, is, you know, early on, or, you know, did this evolve and change over the time, but like, how did um, the aesthetics and uh, culture of, of punk influence, you know, your, your style of, of comics, which in, in a way, um, you know, it retains a lot of the stuff that you grew up reading as a kid, you know. The, the, right. you, the, my first initial experience when I, when I saw Love and Rockets number three, which was the, the first issue that I picked up, I was just like, fuck, this is, this is so beautifully drawn, but, it, but it's, you know, it's, it's Archie comics, though. I mean, I was seeing other things, too, and, um, and the punk, part of it kind of really snuck up on me, but, and it was so subtle, the way that you added in there. And I just, you know, just how conscious of, your, of that, it was 35 years ago, so it's a long time, but like, you know, do you have any uh, thoughts or memories of that, that time as you were putting that together? Um, <clears throat> I didn't really think about it. Um, I just knew that, that um, I borrowed an old style that goes back to the 30s or whatever of comics um, because I was comfortable with that. Um, I like the frame. I like the frame because you know you put the picture inside. It's like watching a movie. You know you got. Um, um, and I remember when I wanted to put my favorite things in it. You know what I was into and stuff. Uh, before that, I already, I already developed my style when I was 15 years old. I mean, you know, it took years later to like draw better or straighter or whatever. But it was just, I just remember around, something around 15 or 16 and drawing and going, okay, this is, I've reached the point where I can draw anything I want you know, whether good or bad, but, <laughs> um, and I just said, okay, I don't have to adjust my style, I don't have to, you know, uh, do a fancy inking style or anything like that, even if I was like, you could see in the early, um, in the early issues, I was just getting out of my Mobius inking style, you know, and some of that is still in there, uh, but, uh, after a while, what took over was I was just, uh, it was just the, the lines that needed to be there, put down. I and mean, it's, it's hard to explain. It's just something that, like, okay, there's enough lines on that drawing. Good. You know, right. move on. Right. Um, um, and when it came to doing uh, things like my, uh, my, punk days and and uh, before that my low writing days um, I f figured I would just draw this is 
I would just draw what it looked like. I didn't need to create. I didn't need to create a, a punk style. My comics weren't going zap across the page, and and someone going playing a guitar, and his face is kind of like stretching with the the way he is doing that. I always thought that was kind of silly because punk was so exciting to me in real life, and the whole my whole the way where I lived and, and all the fashion and, and all that stuff we did was just so cool anyway, it didn't need any help. You know, so that's why I just drew people holding a guitar and people and f fans go, I really like that, that you have uh, yeah. these punk characters. And I go, yeah, and I didn't have to like, I don't know, I just didn't have to do that, fuck you, and the page exploding, and stuff like that, because that's not how I saw it. I was a punk fan, and I just saw, there's a guy on stage, there's a woman on stage, you know, and they, and they dressed really cool, and that's all they needed. You know, these were human beings up there. So, it's, uh, that's why I, I just, uh, I just decided because it, it didn't need any help, you know. Yeah, but it was it was so different than like at the same time when I was reading. Um, I, I guess my comparison would be like what, what Gary Panther was doing in, in Slash and and in some of the other new wave comics of the time and everything, and they were um, intentionally crude to a certain degree where it was. You know the, the way that, that that punk music and everything was so raw and everything that the style of art was um, aping that and and then um, it was yours was just a completely different thing and it was just oh it just happens to have punk elements in it or it, oh it just happens to have dinosaurs or you know science fiction in it too and it's just it's just you know this whole organic uh, mesh that is is was purely your own you know personal vision and everything and that's what really made it um stand out for me and for you know mm -hmm. I, i'm sure i wasn't the only one right well um, thank you was that a question no it wasn't it was a <laughs> stupid statement on my part and I, and I intended to like not get into this conversation i just want to hear you guys I, I love both of you so much and then i'm thrilled to be up here talking to you so i i'm gonna you know try to duck out and let you guys have a conversation <laughs> but um you, uh, Jaime, so you, um, you, obviously you had older brothers who were um, listening to music and reading comics and everything, and you were influenced by them through what they handed down to you. Um, what was the first um, concert do you, that you remember going to? My first... I'm guessing it's going to be some like arena rock thing that... Well, yeah, that was, it was big, you know, auditoriums, you right. know. Uh, my first concert was Roxy Music, the f fourth album, the Country Life tour, okay. and they'd come to L.A. and I, uh, I was really into them. And my brothers felt sorry for me because Gilbert and Mario were always going to concerts, but they wouldn't take the little kids. You right. Know? And uh, but Mario knew how much I loved Roxy Music. He goes, "Hey, I'll, uh, you want to come to this show?" I was like, "I've arrived." You know? <laughs> yeah, and uh, went to that. And yeah. my second was the Sweet. Oh uh, wow! My third was the Sensational Alex Harvey Band at the Roxy in Hollywood. My fourth was was Queen Bohemian Rhapsody tour, but I was already like, oh, they were already sold out, man. They, they they're not cool anymore. <laughs> you know, and then. Uh, I went to a few other ones. I went to Boston, their oh. first tour. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I went to Styx. I think Jesus. their only hit uh, was their only hit was Lady. <clears throat> and then I went to UFO opening up for Rush, and I and I because I liked UFO, but I didn't like Rush. So I guess my other my, my follow up question on that is like, when's the first good concert you went to? <laughs> I mean, Roxy music is terrific and everything. That was good. That was, yeah, that was a big deal. Um, yeah, um, I liked I liked most of them, but you know, some of them stood out more. Um, and then when punk came along, you know, I didn't need yeah. need. I remember going to. A, I was already into punk, and then but Cheap Trick were playing uh, 
at some big stadium, and we were like, do we, we want to go back to a stadium? You know, well, we still like Cheap Trick, you know, and, yeah. and I remember um, we, went, and we still look kind of normal, you know, we're not, we're not punk and stuff, and my cousin had a Ramon shirt, and people just frowned at her. Yeah. She was just like, and some guy goes, you like the Ramones? And she went, yeah, like, hey, and he goes, why? <laughs> and it was just like, I was, we, Gilbert and I were just like, get us out of here. We'd never want to do this again, and we never did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I want to get into the, the marginalization of both hip hop and comics and, and, and punk in a second. But Ed, um, when did music become um, an important part of your life? And um, you, you're you don't have any older siblings, right? So you like it wasn't the same situation. Yeah. Who who were your mentors with with that? Uh, well, the neighborhood that I was kind of born into, predominantly black neighborhood, uh, born in 1982, hip hop is at that point already kind of escaped the uh, the five boroughs, so it made it to to Pittsburgh at, at that time and. Um, you know, every day playing outside in front of the house, there would be people walking up and down the street with boom boxes. Um, my house was in between several playgrounds where, where hip hop things were being done, right? So there would be a basketball court with just like one set of hoops, um, a bunch of people trying to, trying to get on. Um, so while the game was going on, the people who, who wanted to play next, they would just be in a rap cipher or like playing the, playing the dozens or something like that. And, and I remember seeing that, like seeing this like real aggressive, you know, back and forth, which was real fun. There would be people, you know, dancing to music on those boom boxes, um, you know, with the refrigerator carton on the ground, all that stuff. So I saw it all. Um, but when I was a kid, I, w I would spend the majority of my money on comic books, but I would get those, uh, those uh, recordable, like, audio cassette tapes and just give them to my friends to uh, record a bunch of stuff and then, you know, supply me with you know this rap music stuff sure. that they that they were involved with. So I mean, it, it was always a part of a part a part of my thing. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking about with uh, with with Jaime's work, and I mentioned this to you before, but I think it's it's noteworthy is um, with this comic that I do, um, Hip Hop Family Tree. I do a lot of research and I read you know anything I could find, everything I could find, the oldest articles. And uh, there is a, I forget exactly what issue number of Love, Love and Rockets, but uh, it's from 1984 where you have, you know, one character calling somebody else homeboy. And it might be the earliest time that that word was ever in print, you know, like it's possible. After all the stuff that I saw, <laughs> like, like, you know, you had your finger on the pulse, man. Yeah. <laughs> I did it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Well, you had that early on, and, and it was a, a fairly early issue for Love and Rockets. There was a kid spray painting um, um, and gets beat up, and um, like it was so many years ago, I'm, I'm like my mind's blanking. But so there, there was, it wasn't just punk. It was just what, I guess, whatever you were seeing around you, and and you, obviously the um, car culture and, and hot rod stuff and greaser culture of L.A. Um, at the time was 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 an influence, and you're older brother's love of monster movies and, and everything. And, yeah. and I think for both of you guys too, it's, it's, you're really exploring a real, um, just a collage of everything that you, you know, consumed um, as youngsters and, it, and it's made your way into what you're doing today. And, I, think, I think it's real important if, if, we, if we go down that, that kind of course of dialogue to kind of make it clear, at least, uh, you know, for, for my sake that, um, that it's not really nostalgia. Like I'm not doing this like nostalgic thing. I'm not trying to like live in, t in this old world or anything like that because I feel like that implies either, you know, this like weird love of the past and trying to like rekindle the past or uh, more accurately to me, like nostalgia is like, you know, some square old dude who, who, who finds like an old toy that, you know, brings back all these memories. Yeah. And I never put any of this shit down, man. Like I've always, you know, st still, you know, enjoy all the same old records and, sure. and uh, you know, Rob Liefeld comics and shit like that, man. Like, like I'm not one of these, like, um, fly-by-night fans or whatever. Right, 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 right. 
Um, and I and I think that's an interesting thing too that like especially in this setting sitting setting um, of where we are in, at SPX and um, you're two guys who who, who both um, I think had a real love for the type of comics that maybe a lot of people here um, just didn't like you know and it's like the some of the some of the Marvel stuff. Um, you hold on to that stuff and embrace it and, and, and champion it, though, too, and, and it comes through um, in your work and, and it sets apart from um, some of the other people. And that's just a fact, I guess, right? It's not a question or a statement, even. Jaime put me on to Man Bat Number One, which is uh, drawn by Steve Ditko, and it's one of the only times you, you'll see uh, Ditko drawing uh, Batman, and it's very interesting. Yeah. What were you holding just earlier when you got in, were getting on the elevator that, that Frank had given you? Oh, Peter Cannon Thunderbolt comic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got really excited when I saw <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, you know, the, you know I, w I was raised, um, everything was timing. Love and Rockets was timing, how I aged, where, where I was born, in this part of the world, uh, you know, I was four years old when the British invasion came, when the Beatles came over. I was four years old, so I saw, I saw the world change. Right. I didn't understand it, you know, but it was just like all of a sudden uh, children around the world instead of old white-haired ladies that, uh, that you were used to at school or whatever. So. I don't know where I'm going with this, but it, it was just kind of, I was exposed at the right time to this world that just like, you know, Marvel comics were exploding by then too, you know. They were just finally getting their footing. And so I was pretty lucky that I came, I came into the world at a really uh, crazy time that, that, that just fed me the, this, Crazy. I mean, everything from silly TV shows like Gilgan's Island to, you know, to uh, music that was just moving so fast from 1964 to 1967, you know. And uh, so I, I was just lucky to be a part of that, and that just helped shape the way I saw things, you know, and how, how everything everything from being four years old ended up in Love and Rockets, you know, and just, we were just in the first issues, just throwing everything we knew, you know, in there. And I think that just, and not knowing what's gonna come out of it, but not really caring, just like, this is what I wanna put in, this is what I wanna do. And, and, and it wasn't, uh, I remember doing the very first issue and then showing it to friends because I didn't, we couldn't, didn't know how to get it out to fans and stuff, you know, potential fans. And there was a, and I remember, you know, I would draw Maggie at the bus stop and then there would be like an alien waiting for the bus too and, and then some weird thing and then some homeboy walking with a bandana yeah, walking by. And I remember uh, uh, my women friends would go, would go, Oh, Maggie, that's me. I really, you know, you drew me, uh, you know, in that comic and stuff. And then my old homeboy friends would go, go, they'd go, hey, your comic's pretty good, man. But they wouldn't have anything to say about it other than, and then they'd go, I like that homeboy that was walking by. <laughs> yeah. And, they, and I would go, and I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I like that too. You yeah, know, yeah. and so that's why it started to evolve that I was like, yeah, the real life stuff is funner. You know, than than the rocket ships and stuff like that. That's why they, the fantastic stuff started to, as much as I had fun drawing them, started to drop out because right. I, I was going, oh yeah, yeah, my my life is better than a Marvel comic. Right. You know, you know, and and so and just so just all this, I just had so we just had so much material to put in there. You know, but even from the first issue of. Um, of the Fantagraphics Love and Rockets, you have that cover, and you have an alien and a superhero woman, and and, and then the mixed in there, you have this old woman, like, like just like somebody, just this old woman, just in there in, in the in the mix, and it was just like you know that was the weird thing in, uh, on the cover. It was just like the normal thing, 
Yeah, you know? and it, it was just seemed normal to me, you know, just throw, throwing all that shit in there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I remember yeah. when I was young, one of my favorite comics uh, was like in around 1990, uh, there was the Marvel series called What If, and it was like, what if the Fantastic Four, you know, fought Doctor Doom without their powers? So it was like 32, you know, 22 pages of a Marvel comic with people just in regular clothes trying to like figure out how to, how to, how to overcome this kind of uh, villain or something like that. Uh, and it was like the closest thing that I could come to to, to have a, a full comic with like just real life moments because yeah. I would be into Spider-Man but really just in it for the Peter Parker moments. Right. right. And uh, I remember getting a couple extra copies of that comic, um, giving them to my friends and we were like play acting it and everything because it's like we just wanted, like I just wanted, my entire universe of comics was the grocery store and that was the closest thing to a, like a real life uh, sort of personal comic that, that I had access to, right. you know, just mm -hmm. because there wasn't a costume in it for you know, 22 pages or yeah. whatever. You already no have the clothes for it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You just need, like, you know, grab four friends. Yeah. And uh, and you go. And then and then if you had four boys, you'd have to be the invisible boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jaime, when um, your your brother uh, Ishmael was in the band Do Dr. No, mm -hmm. and um, I think that w the interesting thing to me sometimes is I forget that Ish was um, younger than you. Yeah, correct. That I always just assume that it was. I don't know. Just think of him, your older brother, being in this punk rock band, and then you're doing yeah. flyers <laughs> and stuff from. But yeah. that's not the case. He was no, 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 no. Well, Gilbert and I were in bands too, but. Um, we were the only band in our little Oxnard Nardcore thing. <laughs> um, uh, we uh, we were the only ones who didn't record because we were doing the comic. Okay. The comic took over, and we started to get really excited about doing this comic. And all the other bands were like making demos and stuff by then. And Gilbert and I were not. Um, we're not organized enough to put a band together and actually get shit done, you know, because we we're splitting our time, yeah. you know, and the comic was getting more attention than being in a band, you sure. know, and so we were like, and well, I'm actually a better artist than a bass player, so. <laughs> Is that what you played, bass? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I played bass because... Uh, all my brothers and all my friends wanted to be guitar players. Yeah. And I go, I'm going to be bass. And I was in a band before all of them. So. <laughs> so. How about that you added your uh, playing any instruments? No. Or you, you no, ever, I, like, you I ever think I, about like doing some music ever? No, not at all. Like, like from, from a young age, like I always wanted to be a cartoonist. I never wanted to be anything else. Uh, every thought that I had in life like every decision that I had to make, I sort of filtered through like this idea of like wanting to be a cartoonist. And so like when all of my friends were having babies at age 13, I was like, I'm not gonna do that because I just saw that they were instantly extremely poor um, by having like this other mouth to feed and stuff like that. So like it was always about comics and I try to make it extremely clear with Hip Hop Family Tree that I'm not a MC, I'm not a dancer. I tried to do graffiti and I was awful at it. <laughs> I, I was actually semi okay to be honest, but but it's such a such a tough uh, art form. Like everybody is so machismo, and I saw people you know fucking beat people up and found guys half dead on train tracks because some somebody caught up to them because he painted over top of somebody else's stuff. So I'm like, you know, I just don't. I'm just a nerd. Like <laughs> like I don't I don't want to be defending myself. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Um, uh, it's kind of like. Doing comics is like, oh, this is easy, not dangerous <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, less danger. Yeah, actually, because I, you know, I don't know. I mean, if you if you watch Quincy or something, you know, um, the punk scene could be dangerous um, during those those times. You know, they would get beat up or overdose or or whatever. But um, that's like a. That's like a bad comic version of those. Those, those shows were fun. Quin Quincy uh, punks, Chips punks. Uh, Darby Crash was before that in the late seventies. There was CPO Sharky punks, yeah. which they actually used real kids from Hollywood. Yeah. To be and and the, the Dickies 
played, actually played in the background. I mean, they were using real, except the ones that had speaking parts, you know, would be a guy with a wig. Yeah. <laughs> with a spiky wig, and you could tell. And it was like, his name was Slash, you know, yeah. and, and stuff like that, and he had a switchblade. There, there would be comic versions of that, too, in the 70s, when you have, like, an old-ass man like John Buscema, like, trying to draw, like, some street kids in New yeah. York or something, when, you know, in, in their logic, because they've yeah. been sitting at the drawing board for 40 years up to that point, right, so right, they don't right, even right, know right, what right, modern right. fashion is in general, and they're still drawing guys in yeah. trilb trilby hats and shit like that. <laughs> And then when it's time to like draw a punk kid, it's like it's beyond the warriors, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And then I remember when uh, when the X Men went searching for the Disco Dazzler, and they went to her concert, and there was like this big scene of mob of people in the audience and stuff, and all these people making remarks. And then one guy is looking at Nightcrawler with his blue face. He goes. That guy kind of looks kind of punk, and I remember just looking at it and going, being so pissed off. <laughs> just going, God, you guys don't know anything. <laughs> well, that's why, like, when, when, when somebody like Jack Davis would draw, like, the monkeys for some um, TV guide cover or whatever, and, like, you'd have no idea, like, what they, you know, what they looked like or anything like that, and his photo reference was probably off, so you couldn't tell, like, which band member was supposed to be who. Um, and any of the stuff, and they were just, uh, you know. I always like when those old EC guys would, would be tasked with doing that, that sort of thing. Like, you know, the best Star Wars comics that were ever made were like the John Severin cracked magazine uh, movie adaptations uh -huh. because he had just like no clue what it was he was supposed to draw. But it's like, okay, these white guys with the helmets, like, okay, and he would draw it perfectly, you know? Yeah. yeah. Howard, <laughs> Howard Chaikin would take a little artistic license here and there. <laughs> Um, Jaime, mean, what was your, what was your um, favorite band um, a, as a kid, and, and uh, why? Um, as a little kid? Or no, not as a child, but I mean... I like, mean, you know, each, like, each, when you, when, when you, each... When you started to really develop your own tastes that weren't really necessarily influenced by your older right. brothers. Um, yeah, it was about when I, uh, early 70s, my brothers were into glam you know, glitter, and uh, and I remember I really liked Mott the Hoople. That was my first, like, return as a teenager, budding teenager, and being a fan, actual, you know, fan. Uh, Mott the Hoople was it, um, mostly, yeah. And then Kiss came along yeah. in 75, and I, and I was like, I'm here. Monsters, uh, yeah, yeah. Super rock, heroes. and superhero. They're, they're, it's everything in this band. And I like the music. Right. They, this is the first three albums, though. This is before they Kiss Army and all that stuff. Right. But I just remember uh, being such a big Kiss fan. You know, every single uh, of my school books had, you know, makeup. Yeah. <laughs> just makeup and stuff. And I would just draw in my drawing my just whole kiss concerts in my in my notebooks and stuff like that and uh just been totally in, into them and then when the uh the first live album came out that was the fourth album and then all the kids at school got into kiss and i was like like it's not the same <laughs> you know i was very very cynical that way when when something i like got discovered it was ruined yeah, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, but, but but wrestling has some of those same uh, dynamics to it as well. You know, the the false secret identity. You know, sort of like the they're sort of like superheroes. You know, fake superheroes in the. Story. Yeah, yeah. When I saw my first Santo movie, um, I he was a masked wrestler and he fought. He wrestled vampires and and yeah. werewolves well, and stuff. But sometimes uh, that happens. You know that. <laughs> But that was the coolest thing, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like all that stuff fits in, it fits in the same umbrella, like comics, punk, hip-hop, wrestling, skateboarding. Horror movies and monsters. Like VHS tapes and shit. Like yeah, yeah. I, I always believed since I was little that that all belonged yeah. together. And people would go, but that's shit. This is real. And stuff like that. And I go, no, no. Whether it's shit or not, it just all belongs in this youthful like 
like, I want us, I want this, I want, uh, I need this, you know, I, I need uh, this crazy stuff, you know, uh, the New York Dolls singing about uh, turning into the wolf man howling at the moon. And I just go, they're into the wolf man, man, all right, cool. <laughs> you know, it just with that connection, you know, of all that crazy stuff. I don't know yeah. if that's where you're going with that. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And like, I mean, all that stuff is super important. And even just when I was young, it, it sort of helped me develop just, just t taste in general. Like I, as, as a kid, I would just kind of accept everything as it was and that it should, you know, if it's on TV, it should be, it's professional, so it's, it should be good or whatever. And, and when movie stores started to pop up, um, you know, it's possible to to rent every single thing in a mom and pop movie store, and, my, yeah. and that's exactly what my parents would do. And they would grab these tapes, and I was you know five or six years old, and realizing like, this fucking sucks. Like, why does why is this so bad? And even from a young age, I would analytically just try to like almost reverse engineer like, why is this making me feel like crap? You know, <laughs> like. Tom, Tom Savini's uh, Jack the Ripper teleplay, like, go check that thing out. If you could sit through it, I'll give anybody 20 bucks. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, just like the, the crazy imagery of that stuff, uh, you know, it's perfect comic book sorts of material, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the same thing, though, with, with some of the you know the, the rap bands and and um hip hop bands because you know they'll have fake names and you know like stylized names that way and put it you know in, in costumes and um the you know like public enemies get its whole crew and everything they're they're sort of like you know fear of a black planet it's like it's it's you know there's there's so many parallels to to comics that it it makes total sense that you connected the, the, the two yeah. things together, right? I, I, I remember um, just freaking out when uh, when uh, I would hear like punk, old, punk, older punk kids, you know, because I was older, uh, go like, hip hop, that's not even music. And I go, it's coming from you? You came from, you came from the same thing. You can, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what the, that why how it how they could see, they could say that it wasn't connected you know that it wasn't an extension yeah. of that it was just mind boggling my my real connection with um, with that material um, was mostly in the people just performing it um, so I I grew up in a like a very poor town like my parents worked in the steel mills of Pittsburgh. And uh, in like 1981, the steel mills went away. And nine months later, they had a baby. They had me, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? So they had no job, all this kind of stuff. And to just, like I, I'm like an inspiration junkie. I, I need it every day. I need to hear cool stories about people who are able to like accomplish cool things. And, and uh, there are a lot of people that I identify with in the hip hop world who just sort of have come from the sort of uh, um, uh, a kind of extreme environment and uh, like overcome, overcame a, like a lot of adversity to like, to like, you know, uh, express themselves, uh, you know, the way that they wanted to and, and to make the kind of music that they wanted to. And, and um, for me personally, just uh, it kind of gave me some, some juice, to, like just as I was, you know, in, trying to make this, this cartooning career thing happen and like, you know, make that my life's mission to just know that there were people out there who were like working really hard to, um, to accomplish their goals. Like I spiritually kind of identify cartoonists with uh, a lot of hip hoppers, it, it, like a certain kind of cartoonist, you know, not the trust fund babies and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, to I totally get it. I, I, to, I mean, to me, w the first time I heard Public Enemy, I was like, well, that's, if that isn't fucking punk rock, I don't know what it is. Yeah, definitely. You know, it was the most sonic, pissed off thing that I'd ever heard. It was exactly everything I loved about punk, you know? Yeah. It was abrasive and, 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 and thrilling, you yeah. know, in the same way. Yeah, they, I mean, they designed it to be that way. They said it, they, wanted, they wanted to make music that would piss off their girlfriends. <laughs> yeah. because, because, because rap was, uh, at the time, sort of lumped in with R&B and things like that. And R&B was like, you know, Luther Vandross and they just a lot of the you know Chuck and those guys they just weren't feeling it 
so they wanted to make stuff that would just like make their wives and girlfriends ears bleed and, and that's sort of like when they knew they were on the right track <laughs> <laughs> That's a good goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, is, that, is this safe to say Public Enemy is your favorite band still? Oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Like, I, I held out um, while, while receiving many offers um, since I've been doing the hip-hop comics for doing, like, a lot of album covers and tour posters and stuff like that. The way hip-hop works, you can, you, uh, if you overexpose yourself, you're, pl you're played out, and then, uh, you know, you're not going to potentially get an offer that you want or whatever. So I was I was holding out until Public Enemy got in touch. So you know I made those Public Enemy action figures, yeah. and uh, in a lot of ways I sort of knew that they would contact me. You know Chuck, Chuck D used to make, he's a graphic designer by trade. Yeah, yeah. And he made he designed um, the logo. In yeah, he did. He designed the logo. He designed the the album covers, even though he didn't you know do the actual artwork. Um, he made comics um, in the uh, Adelphi College uh, newspaper, right, 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 Tells right, right. of the S Kind. <laughs> um, yeah, so I sort of expected that they would come. My ego works that way, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's working out for you. Um, Jaime, if, um, what, here's a, something I always wondered was, what would um, Maggie and Hopi's favorite um, band be? I don't know because they're not me, you know, and yeah. I and they might like something I don't, you know, and I've never really given them one, you know. Uh, right. I don't. I don't know. I maybe I just kept away from it because I wanted. I didn't want them so close to my tastes because I needed them to be their own yeah. mm -hmm. character. So maybe that's why I never did it. I think about that once in a while. Like, who, who's maybe Maggie's favorite band? And and then I we'll, we'll never know. Can't can't. Well, you one of these days. One, one of these days yeah. we'll know. But okay. but you know what their favorite Keep band you. might be the uh, um, one of the bands in the comic. Sure. You know, a fake fake band, a Ape Sex or something. You know. Right. Yeah, because this new issue. Uh, well, I won't give it away, but. Has well, to do with that. Actually, that's a good segue because uh, we're going to have to go to the questions in a second. But you guys are both doing um, regular comics for Fanographics, um, back to um, regular, normal, old style comic book stuff, and that's that's uh, um, already like happening now. And that's that's a, that's an exciting news for. Yeah, and it's it's, it's the first. It's partly thanks to him that we can. Yeah. yeah. When does issue one come out? Uh, three weeks. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Did you say three weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. Or that's what they tell us. I don't know. <laughs> have you, have Do you have you, your copy? No. no. Did, mm. Have you drawn it yet? <laughs> Hardy har har. <laughs> that's exciting, man. I can't wait. But, but I'm serious. It, it's partly to you um, that Fanographics wants to uh, go back to publishing actual comics. That's why Gilbert did Blubber. That's funny you say like that, that because I we, I saw the blubber solicitation and I was like, let me make a monthly comic. Like, <laughs> like when I saw that thing, I'm like, okay, if you're going back to comics, like let's break down my things and introduce it to a new audience because like my the bulk of my audience is from record shops and and, and regular bookstores mm -hmm. and the direct market like the comic shop people, you know, it's whatever, it's not that big of a deal. Right. Um, so it was almost like let's extend a hand to the comic shop crowd and get get. Get some of the mouth breathers into into uh, <laughs> fanographics books. <laughs> yeah. So so both of those those forms of music and, and comics generally um, are you know they sort of can be viewed by some as, as marginalized um, forms of entertainment. And I just wonder if um, for either of you guys, as just growing up, did you get like shit on from other kids for your your interest and in, in love of that stuff? Or the music or the comics? I don't know, either one. It, you know, it's, you know, um, the combination of the two is, is, is also a valid question. All my friends didn't like it when I got into punk, you know, or to, that I liked, uh, I like white boy music, you know. Um, in my neighborhood, it was, uh, you were into, you know, funk or soul, you know, and m me and my brothers were odd, odd ducks, you know, we yeah. liked that white boy stuff. <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, and and I go back to a lot of the 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 funk and soul back then now, but at the time I was just so like I like my bands and this and that, and my friends hated that. They yeah. they just thought we were weird. Did you mm. have to keep your comics fandom a secret in the in the neighborhood? Um, I didn't need to, but but I wanted to after a while because when I tried to spread the love, it didn't work. You know, <laughs> same same you know with my music yeah. tastes and stuff. So so, but I had I had uh, four brothers and a sister who liked reading comics, so I didn't have to. I didn't have to sit alone in my room all sad, right. <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, our house, living in our house was different from being out in, in public, yeah. you know, there was just some things I didn't share, because after a while, it was just, it just didn't work, you know, and I, and I go, well, I don't want you to, to piss on my uh, likes, you right. know, so I'll yeah, just sure. keep it to myself, right. you know, and so right. I did, did a lot of that with music, comics. Even movies I liked, you know. Yeah. Yeah. When I started to become like a young teenager and still into comics and everything, this big, uh, you know, zeitgeist change uh, occurred whenever um, the, 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 the trading card speculators like imploded that whole universe and then came over and started to pillage comics mm -hmm. and then kind of inflate the price artificially in a lot of things. So when I was coming up, um, even the jocks were grabbing uh, comics by the handfuls, and that's how you get you know, 8 million copies of X-Men 1 selling yeah. uh, you know, to all these kids and stuff. And even like the, you know, the quarterback of the, the school uh, football team, he had a big comic collection, and he would get one of those weekly price guide things. And he would like calculate his net worth <laughs> like every week, like, oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to be able to go to Harvard next year. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then that all went away. Um, but so I don't have that kind of like scar tissue that uh, that a lot of people had who were like in intensely obsessed with comics because like everybody had them mm -hmm. for this like very small window. Uh, and I kept with it um, and started drawing a lot. And when they went away, they almost like just kind of accepted it, like, oh yeah, Ed, you know, he draws, man. He, so, you know, it was like okay for me to continue to <laughs> like comics or whatever, and mm -hmm. I didn't kind of have to shy away from it, but I know a lot of people who, who really were, were closeted about their, their comics love. Yeah, but, but you know, uh, one thing was, um, you know, I was a dorky kid, I was, I was little in, in school and stuff, I couldn't beat anybody up, you know, um, but, I do remember uh, there was a time where, because I was the kid who could draw in the class, yeah. that I was cool. Right. That was the time I was cool, <laughs> even if I was just a little <laughs> kid. And so I didn't get beat up because of that. You, it, know. you know, like the, the public school system, like it really is like teaching you to, to to get acclimated for prison or whatever, man. because like, <laughs> I, I, uh, I have met a lot of people with some of the comics that, that uh, like this WYSIWYG comic about this like hacker who went to jail. I started getting a lot of mail from, from people in prisons, right? Mm -hmm. And they all s would say, because I would be so nervous, I just would express that I was nervous about ever going to jail for whatever reason. You know, we all have bad days, who knows? Um, but they were like, you know what, You're, you would be all right because you would just be a, um, a tattoo artist in, in prison. <laughs> so, so it's like the same thing. Like, you know, if you, if you could draw so, like a cool dragon for a kid who would fuck you up in high school, <laughs> like just, you know, just draw him that dragon every day or something. <laughs> Saved my ass, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> okay, well, um, we have a couple minutes left, um, and I can see there's already 30 or 40 nah, people man, lined up. Nah, wrap it up. <laughs> well, yeah, see, he's shaking his head. We, we, we've we've filibustered too long. 354 here, no? And we, can we, any one question from the audience here? So Music and comics, you're the perfect person to ask. I'm the perfect person to ask. So, do you guys... You, can you... Do I need to speak up? Go I'll on. toss you the mic. Uh -huh. yeah. We're, this is the, almost the end of the whole thing. We can go a little long. It's like we, so oh, we, yeah, you're we, on the show. We two, we two, I'm doing program. <laughs> we, we have two superstars up here. Come on. So do you guys put a lot of, um, not maybe the focus of the, the panels or the pages, but a lot of background material to kind of uh, 
indicate the the era and the 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 not n not credibility not, not not cred or whatever but you know you put in like a a, not, a nodding wink or an easter egg to stuff and what's if assuming that you do what, what's your favorite one that you've snuck by people that that nobody's caught yet i i, th I, f I feel um, like whenever i see that kind of stuff i feel like it's um it's it's uh it's a little bit too much like like it's it's like people are trying to be clever like i sort of know what you're talking about when people kind of like sneak things in and it's like if it's authentic to the time period then it's authentic to the time period like and, and that's sort of where my focus goes like i'm not trying to be extra clever or something like that yeah um i don't really understand the question yeah. oh fair enough <laughs> <laughs> but you, the question is like do you ever sneak in like uh some secret image or something in the background of a, of a comic, but you do that all the time anyway. And it's, yeah, it's yeah, but, like, but uh, sneaking was maybe wrong. Just uh, when you add referential material that, that right. may be obscure or, 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 or trashy. Well, I, yeah, I'll do that, but it's never to manipulate the story or anything. It's never to f for you to take your focus away from uh, from what's happening, the, the flow of the story, um, or it's never meant to, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, I've always drawn little insider jokes or whatever, but, you know, I don't know. It's, it's not important, it's just there, just dress up wallpaper, you know. <laughs> All right, well, we're getting the big stage hook here, and um, um, I want to thank everybody for coming, and let's have a round of applause for these two great artists. <laughs>